All right. So if you want to keep a, a, the bulletin or something in Romans chapter 5, we're going to be getting back to this soon. There's a lot of content in this chapter we're going to dig into, but I need to, to go over a few more things as more way of introduction before we dig into Romans chapter 5. So if you want to keep a bookmark there, we'll be coming back to it. But we're going to flip over to Genesis chapter 2 for the moment. Now the subject of my, of my sermon tonight is kind of a, of a continuation of this morning's sermon. It's getting a little bit more detailed into this, this concept of original sin. Now this morning I preached on the new man on the new creature, the inward man, as the Bible calls it. When you're saved, when you're born again, you have a new creature. Your spirit is born within you. And that spirit is born of God. And that spirit is what drives you to serve God and to do the right things. And it's the flesh that drives you to sin and, and do the wickedness. And we have this fleshly body even after we get saved, which is why people who, after they're saved, they still tend to commit sins. Nobody's perfect. You know, I, I still have sin in my life. Everybody still has sin that they do as a result of being in this fleshly body. But that new creature, as we already talked about this morning, is, is born of God and it's, and it's incorruptible. The new man does not sin. Now, I started getting on this subject a little bit this morning, but I had to pass over it because I'm dealing with it tonight, is this concept of original sin. And um, it's taught in various ways amongst various denominations, and, and, and I've seen um, people have varying degrees of, of how far they really go in depth in this, but we're going to just, we're just going to open up the Bible and just see what the Bible has to say, because a lot of people have teachings, and, and it gets into a lot of philosophy, and a lot of, a lot of inferences, and just a lot of deductions, and a lot of logic, but let's just, let's just try to get right back to the Bible. Let's just see what the Bible's talking about when it comes to sin, when it comes to original sin, because there's a lot of false teaching out there today, and hopefully we just get that straight up, straightened out, and just, and just trust what the Bible says. And people tend to start adding things to the Bible, and it, it, it gets so far out of whack to where you have people today that baptize babies thinking that they need to be baptized in order to be saved and go to heaven. And that all stems as a result from a false belief on what original sin is, thinking that um, we, as, as soon as you're born as a baby, or maybe even prior to that, I'm not sure, depending on what people believe, but, but when you're conceived, when you become a person, that you are inherently a sinner because of Adam's transgression. And again, that's, that leads people to do this infant baptism and all this other stuff. But let's look and see what Adam did. Let's look and see what the consequences were for his actions. Let's get back to that original sin in the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about this. Genesis chapter 2, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we're probably all very familiar with the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They're given liberty. They're given freedom. It's a great place. They don't have to work. You know, God's providing food and everything else for them. You know, you know, Adam at this point doesn't have to work with his hands and till the ground and do all this other stuff. God has completely taken care of them. And he says, here's, here's the rule that I have for you. Here's my law. He says, you're, you're allowed to eat whatever you want to eat. You've got all these trees around. You've got all this fruit. You've got all these different things that you could, you could eat from. But there's this one over here. The knowledge of good and evil, you're not allowed to eat from that. And he says, not only are you not allowed to do it, but is the, he says, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He says, you are going to die the, the same day that you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, let's jump over to chapter 3, because chapter 3 is where they end up um, messing up here and, and sinning by disobeying that one commandment that God had given him. In Genesis 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And see, this is, this is the devil's plan. The devil is very subtle. That's why he's real subtle, more subtle than every be any beast of the field. Satan goes and he's always going to be questioning God's word. He doesn't always just come out and start contradiction to God's word, but what he'll often do is just question it. And that's what we see today when you have, you know, 400 different versions of the Bible that are out there today. 
all claiming to be the Word of God and all saying different things, it, it causes people to think, well, what did God really say? Why, why can I read this book over here and it says one thing, but then I read this other one, it also claims to be a Bible, and it says something completely different. And see, my friends, this is Satan's plan. It's been his plan ever since the beginning. Did God really say that? Well, when you start coming out with hundreds of different versions of the Bible in your language and you're saying different things, you start to wonder, and I get this all the time, I talk to people out indoors, and people say, well, I don't even know what to believe. And the devil's succeeding at his job when he gets people like that. I don't know what to believe. What, what can I trust? Isn't there a bunch of errors? How, can I, how do I even know that what I'm reading today isn't just a bunch of mistakes? Hath God said? Did, have, did God really say that? This is what the devil did all the way from the beginning with, with Adam and Eve. Let's keep reading verse number two. It says, And the woman said unto the serpent, and she knew what God said. She said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, we don't see God saying that you can't touch it, but he said not to eat of it. But um, she's saying, look, you can't eat it, we shouldn't even touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So again, he's casting more doubt. He's like, well, you're not for sure going to die. And he's saying, you know, God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, you're going to be, you're going to know good and evil. You're going to be like the gods. Is, is, what, is what he comes to Eve with and beguiles her and tricks her. And again, that's the same thing. There's so many false religions out there today that, that teach you that you can be like the gods. Mormonism comes to mind where they teach you that you can be like your own God. They believe that as God was, so are we. And as we are, so we'll be like God, basically. And I don't remember, that's not exactly the way that their, their phrase goes. But what they're saying is that God was just like a man like you and me at one point. The God that, that they consider rules over our world, which is the God over the universe, which is the one true God, they don't believe in that God. They believe that we can all become gods, and that's the same trick that, that Satan was trying to deceive Adam and Eve with, or specifically Eve, saying that you'll be like the gods as soon as you know good and evil. You could be your own God. And, of course, they partake of the fruit, and... Um, you know, Eve brings the fruit to her husband, and he partakes of it as well. Verse number 7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Now, prior to eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve lived in innocence. They were not sinners. They had not committed any transgression. And if it makes sense, God's only law was to not eat of that one tree. That's what they had to obey and follow, and they messed that up. But um, they, were, they had an age of innocence, and this is going to be an important concept to remember. They didn't know the law. The only law that they knew was to not eat of that tree, and they didn't know that there was any problem with being naked, for example. They had no idea they were naked. It's just like, I mean, you think of, of you know, I've got these dogs or, or other animals, and I'm not trying to just equate Adam and Eve to animals. Obviously, they're not beasts. But, you know, you look, at, you look at the animals, they don't, it doesn't matter to them that they're naked. It has nothing to do with, with it doesn't come into their thought. It's not, it's not a big deal. And this is how Adam and Eve were. Or a better example, instead of comparing them to animals, would be like little children. Okay, my little, my little children, they, they don't know anything about, like, I need to be dressed in front of people. And sometimes, if you're here, you might see one of my little ones just, just coming out. Sorry, no, we're trying to prevent that from happening because we, we need to teach them. That's something that needs to be taught, that they shouldn't be um, getting naked in front of other people. But little children, they have that innocence, right? They don't know any better. They don't understand. They don't comprehend. They don't know good from evil. And this is going to come into play very important later. Just remember that, that in the same innocence that Adam and Eve had before they knew good and evil, this is going to come into play it's going to be very important later about that innocence of a young child and the innocence of Adam and Eve. Now, God has a punishment for Adam and Eve. Let's jump down to verse 16 of chapter 3. After God talks to them, he finds them, they were hiding, they made aprons, they needed to cover their nakedness, and they were afraid because they, they were naked and they, and they didn't want to confront God. They want God to see them in that condition. And verse number 16 God, this is God giving out his judgment now upon them because they, because they had sinned. Verse 16 says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. 
and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And this is something that seems to be completely forgotten today, that God, this is one of the judgments that God gave on women, that, that, your, that the woman's desire is going to be to her husband, and he shall rule over thee. God has, has ordained the husband to be the head of the household, to be the ruler in that household. This is the biblical family structure. That you don't have two people who are in charge that have an equal vote. Because if two people have an equal vote and you disagree on something, what do you do? If, if, if one person is one thing, the other person is the other thing, how are you going to resolve that problem? Well, God solved that real simple. And he said, you know what? There is an authority in the house and it's the husband. And the wife is going gonna, is gonna, to, her desire should be to her husband. And he's going to rule over her. That was, that was one of the judgments. But then to Adam, Adam got his judgment, verse 17. He says, And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou sh shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, so far well, we, we don't see anything here and, and again, we're, we're going to be getting into this. That's why we start off with Romans chapter 5. We don't see anything here that um, condemns every single person in the future. God gives a judgment on Adam and on Eve for their personal sin that they committed. They, you know, it's, we, we just read it. And then they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden and said, Okay, now from now on, you had it made in here. I was taking care of you. You had no work you had to do. Now, by the sweat of your face, Adam, you're going to go out. You're going to till that ground. You're going to work. You're going to work with your hands. And that's how you're going to have to survive. You can't, you can't be in this garden anymore. You're, you're kicked out of here. And um, in God's own law, and he holds everybody personally responsible for their own actions. Now, that's not to say that when a person sins, it doesn't impact other people. Right? But when it comes to being judged, when it comes to, you know, especially a salvation or, or anything like that, hey, we're all responsible, we're all liable for our own actions. A, one person's sins might impact the life of others. For example, if I were to just become an alcoholic, if I were to just to go out to the bar every night and start wasting my money on booze and come home and maybe get angry, you know, I might, I might end up hurting my wife or hurting my children. Now, is that any fault of their own? No, that would be as a result of my sin. But that's also not, a, that wouldn't be a judgment because of anything that they had done wrong. It would be my sin negatively impacting other people, but it's still not the same as a judgment coming upon her for what I've done. If that makes sense. In Deuteronomy 24, 16, you have to turn to the Bible, says, The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. This is God's own law. I mean, this is, this is the law of God. This is what God believes to be just, is that we are held liable for our own sins. So tell me, if Adam sinned, you know, some 6,000 years ago, why is it that just because of his sin, I would just be a sinner that deserves hell just for, for, by virtue of being born? That doesn't make any sense, yet that is what some people believe. Some people believe that, that this original sin is, is that we're born totally depraved. And this is a wicked, see, 
We're not a Calvinist church at all. I reject all five points, the tulip of a Calvinist, and we're going to go over this total depravity. It's that T in their acronym, tulip, for, that they believe in. These hyper-Calvinists that believe in... Um, and just to, be, just to, to mention, you know, if, you, if you have a doctrine and it's just named after a man, I'd seriously question that doctrine. If it's not, unless that man is Jesus Christ... And it's just coming straight from the Bible. If you have, a, if you have an entire religion or, or an entire doctrine just to say, I'm a Calvinist, like, I'm a John Calvinist, like, you, you, you're definitely going to have something wrong with that religion because no man is perfect. And um, we need to just be getting our, our doctrine straight from the Bible. But I, I, I actually found this website, and it's in Reformed Theology. Now, my personal background, I grew up in a Presbyterian church. That's how I was born and raised for my entire life which is a Reformed church. So for those of you who may not be familiar with, with different types of church history, you have Reformed churches. It's not just one church. Reformed, essentially, is a Reformed Catholic church. At the time when Martin Luther posted his thesis and he broke off from the Catholic church, Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. Martin Luther found all kinds of problems, all kinds of things that they were doing that he disagreed with, and he said, you know what, this needs to be fixed. And he actually wanted to just reform the Catholic Church before he actually broke away from it. That was his desire, was to say, hey, let's just get these things right and keep moving forward. But that was too much for the, for the Catholic Church to change. He split off, and that's what started the Protestant churches. Protestant means, it, it comes from the root word of protest, right? They're protesting against the Catholic Church. So what they did was they formed these reformed churches. They reformed the Catholic Church into these Protestant churches. Now, you'll find Presbyterians, Lutherans, right? Luther, Martin Lutheran Church, um, Methodists. There's, there's, a, there's a variety of, of denominations that are out there today that follow the teachings of Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, all these guys that came out of this Reformation. And... This, this Calvinist doctrine is, very, is found very heavily in these, in these Reformed theology and these Reformed churches, and that's part of their belief. So, we're only, I'm not going to, it's not an entire sermon on Calvinism, believe me, but it's an extremely wicked doctrine, and I'm just going to cover this total depravity because it's, it's tied in completely with original sin, which is what I'm, we're trying to look at tonight. And, and when you start to hear this, it, it is unbelievable to me that... that this is taught as doctrine, and I don't do this very often because I don't like just, just going into what other people believe a whole lot, but it seems to be creeping in all over the place, and, and people just have a tendency to accept stuff that they hear without, without really checking into it and seeing for themselves whether these things be so from God's Word. This idea that we're totally depraved as human beings that we just are completely unable of doing any good work. We're just, we have no hope whatsoever, which, again, there, there's, there's always kernels and nuggets of truth in, in, in all these beliefs, but what Satan does is he takes the truth and he just twists it, he perverts it. And that's what all, all of the best lies, all the lies that get the most people to follow it, are going to have a lot of some truth mixed into that, but it's all perverted and it's all twisted to not be true anymore. But I'll just read this for you. This is taken from a Reformed Church's website. Okay, it doesn't matter what the, what the church is. Um, but this is a doctrine that, that sums up what a lot of people believe. And this is specifically about depravity. So I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, or, excuse me, the Bible does not say this. The church's belief system says this on depravity. The doctrine is sometimes called total inability emphasizing correctly sinful man's inability to do good. This name, however, is deficient in this respect that it describes man's wickedness only as a lack of good, while the opposite is also true. Sinful man not only lacks the good, but is actively and willingly evil. And since the word depravity does not emphasize this, total depravity is the better name. So when we describe man's sinfulness as depravity, we are not just saying that he is bad or wicked, but that he is rebelliously and deliberately evil, that he loves and delights in wickedness of every kind. He is not just passively overcome by sin, but actively and willingly uses his strength, ability, and gifts 
to sin. Think about that now. What they're saying is, think about what you were like before you got saved. And see if this lines up with you. Now, I'm not making light of our sins in any way. Okay? Every sin that we've committed is worthy of a punishment in hell for forever, for an eternity. Our sin is not, it's not something to take lightly. However, to say that with every ounce of our being is essentially what this is saying, that your only motivation and goal was just to do wickedness all the time, to do evil, to, to delight in wickedness of every single kind. I don't, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. I don't think that that is just always what every unsaved person is just, is just all about. They're taking things from the Bible and, and twisting them and perverting them to say something just bizarre like this. The, the, or, not, okay, I keep praying myself, the Bible. So we used to go into the Bible saying, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. The Bible doesn't say this. We're, I'm going to keep reading from their, from their site here. The idea is then that men are very wicked, much more wicked than they themselves would ever admit. Nor is this wickedness accidental, but deeply embedded in what a man is, what we call his nature. In other words, his depravity is not something he has learned, or that is the result of his environment, but he is by nature wicked. He does not just do evil, but is evil. He is conceived and born a sinner. And this is what, we're, what I'm preaching against, saying that we're just automatically born a sinner. The moment that you're born, you're a sinner. And I don't believe that. The explanation for this is original sin. By original sin, we refer to the sin of man in Adam and every man's responsibility for the sin that Adam committed. They're, they're saying that we are responsible for what Adam did 6,000 years ago. Adam did not stand in paradise as a private individual. His deeds having consequences for himself alone. But Adam stood in paradise as the head and representative of us all. He was the king of the earthly creation. Being a king, what he did affected all those over whom he was king. The result was that when Adam sinned, we sinned. His sin was reckoned by God to be our sin. sin. And they, they point to Romans 5.12, which we opened up in reading Romans 5. And we're going to get into that and see very detailed what this teaches. Now, you might have heard some things that sounded like, oh, okay, well, that doesn't sound that bad. That sounds pretty true. You know, like we have a sin nature. I believe that. Okay, we have a sinful nature, and there's, there's many places, and I'll, and I'll read some of these scriptures for you, that back up the fact that we do have a sin nature, but that does not make us totally depraved from birth. Okay, I don't buy that either. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sure, the heart of man is deceitful and it's wicked. I'm not saying it's not, but to say that we're completely and totally depraved and just and just love and joy and all manner of sin and wickedness, and that's all we ever want to do, is not the same thing. Galatians 5, 17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. We looked at that earlier this morning. Ephesians 2, uh, verse number 2 says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And then in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21 says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now, we have a sinful nature. We have a sinful flesh that, that drives us to, to do sin. That drives us to do flesh or to, to, to do things that are wrong. It pulls us in that direction. Yet we still have a will and we still have a conscience. We're still able to make that choice. Now, don't forget that our Lord Jesus Christ was born as a man. Now, God was his father, yes. However, Mary was his mother. Mary was a sinner. 
in order to buy into this concept of original sin, you'd have to say that, well, Jesus was born of a, of a woman, and they'll try to say, oh, well, but God was his father. Yeah, but she was still born of that woman physically on this earth. Jesus Christ became completely a man. He took on himself the restrictions of being a human being. Jesus Christ faced the same temptations that we face. Jesus Christ had um, the, the, the testings, the temptations of, of, of sin, yet he didn't sin. He always chose right. He always did that which was good. He was perfect in everything that he did. But the, the temptations were still there to do wrong, to, to do what's not right. And, um, but he was always able to, to, to choose the right path and to do that which is right. Um, we can't forget about that. Jesus was a man. And um, all those verses I just read too, by the way, they'll use those same exact verses to support their doctrine of total depravity. They even try to use Romans 1 to say that that's how everybody is before they get saved. Now, Romans 1 is talking about people who God gives up. It's talking about people who are reprobate, people who are rejected by God. Read Romans 1. It talks about the Sodomites. It talks about people who are given over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. There are people that can draw, that can go push things too far with God, where God gives them opportunity after opportunity to get saved. They hear the truth. They reject it. They reject it. They reject it. And after time, if they continue to reject God's word, God says, I've had enough. And he gives them over to a reprobate mind, and they are rejected by God. This is a teaching that has kind of lost its path today, but um, it's very important to understand that. And when they try to apply Romans chapter 1 to just your average unbeliever, it's false. It's not true. Not everybody is a God hater that that's reprobate that 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 does abominable acts with people of the of the of the same gender. It's it's totally ridiculous to say that that is the same as uh, as someone who's just unsaved and that that's how everybody's hearts and minds are just all the time. It's it's a lie. Let's go back to Romans chapter five where we're going to go through this um, this section. A lot more detailed now, um, having just kind of getting that background with Adam and Eve and seeing the sin that they did and understanding, you know, again, if, if God were to hold us responsible as, as that website claims, that Reformed theology claims that because of Adam's sin, we're responsible, we have our own responsibility for that, that goes against God's own law, the fathers not being put to death for the children and the children not being put to death for the sins of the fathers. We all have our, we're, we all bear our own sins. We're not held responsible for what someone else does. Now, the result of Adam's sin, I do believe, has impacted us. It has negatively affected us, but I believe it would be the same way as my example of if I became a drunk and started negatively impacting my, my spouse's and my children's life. But it doesn't mean that they're going to be judged based on my sin. It's not like God's going to say, well, you're going to go to hell because your husband became an alcoholic. No. They're not going to be put to death. We're not going to get that punishment of death because of somebody else's sin, which is what this total depravity teaches, that because of Adam's sin, that that's what we deserve, is that punishment of hell. Um, Romans 5, let's look at verse number 12. We're in Romans 5, because this is where, it's, where it really picks up into the, uh, the topics that we're covering. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12 reads, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all of sin. Now, I forgot to mention this before. I don't see I didn't have my notes. But when Adam sinned, think about this. God said, The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did Adam die the same day that he ate that, that, that fruit? Absolutely he did. But did he die physically that day? No. His spirit died. And this ties in with what I was preaching about this morning. See, Adam had a, an alive, a lively spirit when he was created, when God made him. And he had that soul and the spirit and his flesh. But the day that he ate of that fruit, when he sinned, when he committed that sin, he knew the law. He heard it, he committed the sin, 
his spirit died that very same day. And if that's not what it's talking about, then God's a liar because he obviously didn't physically die. His spirit died within him. He needed to be born again the same way that we need to be born again today. And it's not until we actually commit sin where we need to be saved that we need to be born again. If my infant child, my one-year-old, were to die today, God forbid, she would go straight to heaven. She does not have sin. She doesn't know good from evil. She doesn't know the law. She doesn't know any of this stuff. She does not have an inherent sin. She's not, God's not going to send my one-year-old daughter to hell because of what Adam did 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. God is not that perverted or corrupt of a judge. He's a just judge. He judges us based on our own sins. Look, when she grows up, Lord willing, she'll grow up, she'll have plenty of her own sins to deal with. Okay, it's not, that's not anything we have to worry about because we do have a sinful nature. We have a sinful flesh that drives us to sin, but it doesn't mean that God holds us responsible just from conception, from the moment that we're born. Romans 5, anyway, I, I, I kind of skipped over that. But um, look at, in verse number 12 again, it says, So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So right here we clearly see death didn't pass upon all men just because of what Adam did. He says, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Look, we're all sinners. Death passes upon us. The wages of sin is death. Our own wages for our sin is death. He says, for until the law, sin was in the world. Just like... You know, with, with Adam and Eve, they were naked. And they shouldn't have been naked. But, um, so sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. If God doesn't say, hey, you need to be clothed, this is my law, then there's no sin there for them because they didn't know, um, because the law didn't really exist. Um, verse 14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was a figure of him that was a come. Now, it doesn't say that they didn't sin. It just says that they didn't have the same sin that Adam had. And if you think about it, how could you? Once you're kicked out of, that, of the Garden of Eden and it's being guarded by angels, you're not going to get back in there to eat of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It's impossible. So no one has been able to, to sin the same sin that Adam committed of eating of that fruit. But we all have our own sins. God had his law, and we have, we've all had our own transgression. He said, look, death reigned from Adam to Moses. People have died all since then, and the reason is because we're all sinners, because we've all broken God's laws on our own. Verse 15 says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ is about unto many. There's these little fragments and sections of verses that the people will, will, will try to cling to to support their false doctrine of this original sin. Um, and you've got to be careful about that, which is why we're reading this entire chapter. We read it, we started off reading the entire chapter, and we're going to go through this in context to see the totality of it. Just as in Romans chapter 3, you know, Paul's talking about all these different things, and then he says, Therefore we conclude. The whole conclusion. He says all these different things. But we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So he's talking about the law. He's talking about faith. He's talking about all those different things. And then he comes to the conclusion. You can't just go necessarily and just pull out a verse before you get to the conclusion and context of the matter and just say, oh, yeah, see, this is, you know, and come up with a whole doctrine based off of it. So we're going to see here. So it says, for if through the offense of one many be dead, They'll run with that and say, yep, see, because Adam sinned, that is the whole reason it, that we're responsible for Adam's sin. That's not what that says. The offense of one, many be dead. It doesn't say that, there's a lot of things it doesn't say. That's all it says, and that's still a true statement. But let's keep reading here, verse 16. I don't want to focus too much on, on their false, faulty logic. Verse 16 says, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense 
death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men and the justification of life. Now notice, in all these verses, it's comparing Adam's sin with what Jesus Christ did for us. What we see is every time it's, a, it's the, the, the condemnation and the free gift. Death and eternal life. And he's making this comparison. This is really important to notice because this is what's going to help us to understand what are they even talking about here when they say, therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Does that mean we're responsible for Adam's sin? No, and here's why. We're going to see just in a couple verses. Verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Verse 18 and 19 sum up this entire thought in Romans chapter 5. Because it's crucial to understand the way that judgment came on all men as it's describing with Adam, that same way that judgment came on all men, it's the same way that righteousness came to all men. That comparison is key to understanding original sin. Saying that because Adam sinned, every human being is automatically a sinner is false. Because that removes our free will and our own personal accountability. That would be like saying that because Jesus died for everyone, then everyone is automatically saved. This is the comparison that's being, that's being made here. When you come to the conclusion that, oh, well, because Adam sinned, we all deserve, we're all going to go to hell, we all are going to go to hell because of his sin, that's like saying, well, because Jesus died for everyone's sins, everybody is just automatically going to heaven. That would be the conclusion that you would have to make to take this interpretation of original sin that people take, saying that, well, we are held responsible for Adam's sin. We're not. Okay, we have inherited, okay, I'll agree with a sinful nature. We know that, that we have a sinful flesh. We know that we have a sinful heart. But we are responsible for our own sins. This is not something we're held liable for. And that's why it's so important when we're reading Romans 5 to see what is it, what are they saying? What's being talked about? What do they keep bringing up? Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for every single person's sin. He died for the sins of the whole world. Everybody who's ever lived, every sin that they've ever committed, Jesus Christ bare that sin. He became sin for us when he died on that cross and rose again three days later. He paid in full for that price. But again, that doesn't mean that every single person gets is saved and goes to heaven because there's one thing that we have to do. We have to put our faith on Christ in order to receive that forgiveness, in order to receive that free gift that Jesus did for us. And Adam commit that sin, yes, but it doesn't mean that we're all automatically guilty. We have to choose to walk in that flesh, to obey those lusts thereof, by, you know, which would be committing sin, which condemns us on our own. Either way, it's a choice. Salvation is the choice of putting our faith in Christ. Condemnation is the choice by, by committing sin and disobeying God's laws. It's the same comparison. That's what we have to understand. Um, we're almost done here. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We choose to believe just as much as we choose to sin. We choose to believe on Christ the same way that we choose to sin. Adam had his own choice to make. He could either obey God's commandment or disobey. He chose to disobey. But just because he chose to disobey does not mean that now nobody has a choice in the matter. And, th and this is, see, this one simple topic gets everything so just, just spun out of whack with this Calvinism saying that, well, God elected people, God chose people, this is the way it has to be because in order for, for some babies to go to heaven and some infant and all this other stuff, they would have had to have been chosen by God that, that because even though they have this original sin that they had to already have been chosen, that... that they're saved and that God's going to overlook, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of mess that you get into when you start perverting the truth of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 20. 
The Bible says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice, again, it's a comparison of Adam with Christ. In Adam, in the flesh, at the similitude of the flesh, we die. We have that sinful nature. But in Christ, everyone's made alive. So if you follow the, the example of Adam and, and commit the sin, you're going to die. If you follow the example of Christ and put your faith on him, then you have life. It says, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ is coming, then come at the end when he shall deliver it up, the kingdom of God, the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. Jump down to verse number 44 of 1 Corinthians 15. This is talking about different, different types of bodies. Verse 44 says, It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Again, we're, we're having a comparison of Adam with Christ. Every single time we see this, it's always the same comparison. This is why it's so important to point out and understand that, that, that it's, it's always the same comparison. So if you're going to go one direction with half of this comparison, in order to be consistent with your belief, you'd have to do the same thing on the other side of the equation, which proves the original sin theory false. But um, the, second, the last Adam is talking about Christ. We'll see that in a minute was made a quickening spirit. That's a spirit being born again. Verse 46, Howbeit that, how be that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So there's that second man, the, second, the last Adam. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And this ties in again with this morning. Our flesh and our blood is not going to go to heaven. This body is going to stay down here. We'll get a new body. But that's not a body of flesh and blood. The Bible says that right now the blood is the life of the body. Our new bodies are not going to have blood. It's going to be flesh and bone as Jesus Christ had in his glorified body when he came back and he said, handle me. Flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. He said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Our, our corrupt bodies are not going to inherit any corruption. They're going to be completely changed and transformed. They do not, um, they're not going to inherit any corruption. So now we get to this last point now about, about infants and babies. Well, if they were to inherit original sin and just be sinners from the moment they're conceived, then if they were to die, they would have to go to hell to satisfy that judgment. This is false. It's a falsehood. When infants die, they go to heaven. And this is, again, that fear of this original sin is what causes people to baptize their babies and do all this other stuff because they're afraid, hey, what, what can I do to make sure that they don't go to hell before they could even get to a point to understand to put their faith in Christ? And um, the Bible refers to Mary as being with child. If you want the references for these, in Isaiah 7, 14, I'm not going to turn there, the Bible gives a prophecy of Jesus Christ saying, a virgin shall conceive. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. And that same verse is quoted in Matthew chapter 1, in verse number 23, and it states, a virgin shall be with child. So the, the quotation in the New Testament of that Old Testament scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive. The New Testament says, a virgin shall be with child. Conception and being with child are the same thing, which is why we believe that life begins at conception. As soon as a woman conceives seed in her womb, she is automatically with child. 
That is a human being. That is a child. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what type of names that science wants to call it, a blastocyst or a, fe a fetus or whatever inhuman type of names they want to put on it to justify murder. The moment that that conception takes place, that is a human being. That is a child. Mary was with child when she conceived. That's what the Bible teaches. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But from that moment, from the moment of conception, you have a living, you have a living human being inside of your body. A woman does um, until they're born. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. And this is the last place I'll have you turn. I'll read for you. Just, just, there's two proofs I want to give you from Scripture proving that children, infants, little, little babies will go to heaven automatically when they die. 2 Samuel 12, I'll read this for you in verse 21. This is talking about the judgment that, that King David had. Remember, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and, and he killed Uriah the Hittite, her husband. He had him killed in battle. He committed murder. He committed adultery. She was pregnant. She had a child. And God killed that child. That was one of the judgments that God had against David for that wicked sin that he did. And Verse 21 of 2 Samuel 12 says, Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was, while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst arise and eat bread. So they're wondering, like, you were just grieving and mourning and praying and fasting and not eating when the child was sick and alive. But now that we told you the child's dead, because they're expecting him then to be extremely sorrowful and just you know, mourn even more over the loss, they're saying, why are you getting up and eating and, and, you know, what's going on here? You're confusing us. Why are you acting like this? He explains to him, he says, in verse 22, and he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And this is the key to this verse. He says, I shall go to him but he shall not return to me. Now, if that child went to hell because of original sin, then that's David saying, I'm going to go to him, meaning that he was going to go to hell. But we know that David was a saved man. There's, I don't even, I'm not even going to, going to humor going through the Bible to prove that David was saved and that he went to heaven when he died. So him saying that I shall go to him is, is, is one piece of evidence showing that when a child dies, when an infant dies, they go straight to heaven because otherwise David couldn't say, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me because he was going to go to be in the same place that his child went to. Romans chapter 7, look down at verse number 7. And we saw this earlier this morning, but um, the Bible reads, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This is the Apostle Paul writing saying, I was alive. Paul, the Apostle Paul is like, I was alive once without the law. There was a point in my life where I was alive. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. This is this. This holds true for all of us. We have that spirit, which is which is again, it, it comes in full circle. Why we need to be born again. It's that moment when we when we um, understand, and we 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 can have some type of, of accountability for our own actions. And again, I, I'm not claiming to know what age that is or what mental capacity is. God knows that. Okay? But, and I know it's, it's relatively young. I know there's a lot of kids, there's a lot of people who've gotten saved at young ages that they're able to understand the gospel, they're able to understand doing right from wrong, they're able to understand God and, and, and that he has laws for us. Um, and they're able to, to comprehend putting their faith on Jesus Christ to save them. Whatever age, it may be different from different people, I don't know. But there, there is an age, there is, there is an understanding that we, that we get to as human beings 
where God starts to hold us responsible for our actions. And when the commandment comes and sin revives, when we choose to do what's wrong and that sin happens, that's when our spirit dies. And that's when we need to be born again. But there's no way that Paul can say that he was alive if that original sin already had him totally depraved and, and dead and and just only desiring and wanting always to do wickedness from the, from the moment he was conceived. It's a false doctrine. Um, but anyways, this should prove, and, and there's, there's one other evidence I'm not going to give it to. I, I preached an entire sermon on, on the book of life, and um, you know I believe that the Bible teaches that everybody's name starts off in the book of life because God's not willing that any should perish. And we see all throughout the Bible people's names being removed from the book of life. But we don't really see people's names being added to it. And it's the book of life from the foundation of the world. I believe God wants, wants everyone to be saved. And when you die without Christ, your name gets removed. Or you come reprobate, your name gets removed. You tamper with the word of God, your name gets removed. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you, your name gets removed. But um, I believe we all start off there, which, again, you know, your name has to be written in that book of life in order to go to heaven. The Bible teaches that, and um, which is another reason why I believe you know, infants, their, their name is already in that book. It's not until they sin or not until they do something like that that would, that would jeopardize that at all in any way. But um, let's borrow our word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, uh, for your word. God, I pray that you please just, just help us all to understand this doctrine. It's, it's an important doctrine. Um, hopefully everyone has already um, maybe been founded on this truth, dear Lord, but... Uh, when we start twisting and, and corrupting Scripture, dear Lord, and even, even a doctrine that might not seem on the surface to be an extremely important one, Lord, it leads to, to so many different heresies and so many false teachings, dear Lord. Um, we know that we have a sinful nature. God, help us to, to subdue the flesh. Help us to overcome the flesh, dear Lord, and to walk in the Spirit. And uh, for, the, for the gift of salvation and that wonderful gift that that, that you've given to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us every day, dear Lord, not just on Sundays or not just on Wednesdays. Help us every single day of our lives that we wake up to choose to walk in the Spirit, dear Lord, and to put away the lust of the flesh. And I pray that you would please just help us to be mindful of these things. Lord, when we get in situations where we might be tempted to sin, that you you bring to remembrance some scripture, some of your words, dear Lord, to help us to, to stop ourselves from from yielding to that temptation. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.